Many people today live with regrets. And let me tell you something about regrets. They'll kill you. And the religious world, that is, the religious world, the religious church, wants you to live in regret. It's almost like they love bringing up, and come on, let's be honest, we've all sinned. I mean, the Bible clearly states that we all sin and fall short the glory of God. There isn't a specimen out there, a human being, that has lived a sinless life. Somewhere, somebody has messed up. And we've all messed up. And if you haven't got caught, how many skeletons are in the closets of several people, millions of people, if not a lot of us? So, come on, no one's going to get out of this world without messing up. But God, through Jesus, has remedied that by His Son. The sacrificial death of Jesus, the finished work of Christ, has remedied all sin. God knew you were going to sin before He even called you. Let's even go clear back to the garden. He knew Adam and Eve was going to sin. How do I know that? Because the Bible says Jesus Christ was the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Before He created Adam and Eve... He already had Christ as the, as the Lamb who was going to come 4,000 years after Adam and Eve sinned and become the sacrifice for all sin. So we've all sinned. There's not a person out there who hasn't blown it in one way, shape, or another, right? So God knew when He called us. He knew that David was going to do the thing with Bathsheba. Adultery. Murder. And still he anointed him to be king and called him a man after my own heart. So let's not get religious here. But the church, the religious church, wants you to live in regret. Because they can keep you, if they can keep you full of guilt, shame, condemnation, and judgmentalism, hey, they've got, they can control. You control people by shaming them. You control people by guilting them. And that's the ace in the hole, if you will, that the religious church has by bringing up something you did a year ago, hey, even a week ago. And then they make us feel like second-class Christians. We're not worthy now to be part of the elite with God. We're now down here because we messed up. And most people, and that would include unsaved, live in regret. And that is something I refuse to do. And you don't hear very many people tell you this, especially preachers, that will tell you, I refuse to live in regret. Well, what, what, what are you saying? Are you saying that something you did 10 years ago? Something you did 20 years ago? What if, let's take the worst thing you've ever done in your life. The very, I mean, think, the very worst thing that you have ever done in your life. Think about what it is. Do you regret that? Now let me just sidebar that with this. I regret it in this respect. I wish I was perfect. I wish I would have came out of my mother's womb um, perfect. I wish that I would never... My mistakes not only hurt me. My sins don't only hurt me. They hurt other people. Okay, so I'm not saying that... Oh, well, K okay, Sarah, Sarah, let's just be who we... I mean, no, I'm saying I am not going to live in regret in the respect that, hey, I sinned. I'll own that sin. But I will also... And this, is, and this is what Martin Luther said when he said sin boldly, but rather boast even more on what Christ did on the cross. I'll, I'll own my sin. And this is why I'm not going to live in regret. Because I could not do anything different than what I did back whenever I did it. Let me give you an example. Let's say 20 years ago I committed one hellacious sin that not only rocked my world but maybe the worlds of other people. Okay? Now 20 years, fast forward, 20 years to this day, I will meet people and they'll say, don't you regret what you did 20 years ago? Now, in respect of I wish I, would, I wish I could be perfect and I wish I could live a sinless life, yeah, I wish that. That's not reality, folks. And this is the thing about regret. 
It's not reality. You're not living reality when you live in regret. Here's how you live in reality with regret. Let's say 20 years ago, I made a mistake. Now we fast forward to this to this day, 20 years later, someone comes up to me, a religious person, and says, "Aren't you? don't you feel bad about what you did? Don't you regret what you did? I have to answer that in, out of eternity, not out of time. Oh, so what do you mean? I was who I was back then. You couldn't have you couldn't have changed my mind with what I did. I was who I was with my weakness, with my mindset, my limited understanding of Christ and the finished work, my limited understanding of grace even at that time. I was I was living in total immaturity. Let me tell you something. There's still immaturity, and when I talk about immaturity, I'm talking about perfection. When Paul says, let us go on to perfection, the word is maturity. We ought to always be maturing in Christ, growing in grace. But back then, 20 years ago, that'd be like going up to a kid who's 20 years old, no, 21 years old, and saying, don't you regret um, spoiling in your diapers, whatever you, pooping in your diapers when you were one years old. Wasn't that disgusting? Look at you now. You're a grown man. And, and you went through two years of diapers. Don't you, don't, don't you regret having to be that way? You sucked your thumb. You, 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 you peed on your mom. I mean, think of everything an infant does that uh, if an adult would do would be totally hu humiliating and embarrassing. Right? Now, I'm being facetious here, but it's a point. You're going to take me back 20 years ago and ask me if I regret what I did. I had no other option. Now, see, that's what's going to disturb a lot of people. What do you mean you didn't have any other option? I was, I'm going to say it again, I was who I was. I had a mindset. You couldn't have changed that. It's who I was at that point in time. God wasn't done with me yet. He's still not done with me. He was working on me then, but I was only who I was. I am not. wasn't trying to be anybody other than what I was. I had weakness, a mindset back then that I don't have today, weakness back then that I may not have today. And we can go down through the list and say, I am not the same person today as I was then. So here's the other question. Well, if you could go back, would you at least do it differently? That's a hypothetical that's not reality. I can't do it different. If I could have done it different, I would have at that point in time. If you've given me a cross, a, 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 cross, a fork in the road, and, 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 you, and you made left, and that was a mistake, and say, well, if you could go back, would you go right? With the mindset that I have today? Absolutely. But I can't take the mindset. I can't take the maturity that I have developed to this day back then. That's who I was. I could do no other, other than what I was. Look at David. Number one, King David. He should have been out with the kings. He's on the rooftop late at night. He, he, he should have been out there with the kings fighting because the Bible says it was the time of war when the kings went to battle. Why he wasn't at his post, I don't know. Okay, Why was he coming up there at midnight? He couldn't sleep. Now let's look at Bathsheba. Do you think that, that, that what, what's a woman doing bathing at midnight? I think she saw, and this is what other his historians have even commented on, that she probably knew that it was his habit, sleepless nights, and putting a light on her, taking a bath on the top of a roof, lower than the roof that King David, right there. Come on, you know? You could go back and say, David and Bathsheba, do you two regret what you did? And they would say, well, who we are today and understanding God in the way that we do today? Yeah, that. But I was lonely. I couldn't change that. I didn't have the mindset that I have today. I didn't have the maturity that I have today. And David and Bathsheba would say to you, but that's who we were. Now, if that doesn't suffice the argument here of no regrets, this will. And I saved the best for last. Jeremiah 18. God took three powerful men to the potter's house. Jeremiah, Isaiah, and the Apostle Paul. And what is the lesson with the potter's house? God's the potter, we're the clay, and the wheel are the experiences of life that God has us in. The journey that you're on, that I'm on, that's the will. 
and God uses the good, the bad, the ugly, all things working together for our good. Everything on the wheel, life is working. Everything, even the bad. God, the devil meant it for evil. God meant it for good. So God's got us in his hands. So let's take me 20 years ago, committing a horrible sin. Was I in the hands of the potter 20 years ago? Were you in the hands of the potter however many years ago you blew it? Okay? So you're in the hands of the potter, and God's molding you. Now, was you a finished work 20 years ago, 10 years ago, a week ago? I mean, I'm on that wheel right now. You're on that wheel, and we're spinning, and God's got his hands. I'm not the same person today I was a month ago. If, God, if I'm in the hands of God, and I'm growing in grace. See what I'm saying? So 20 years ago, 10 years ago, whatever, whatever it was. I remember, we're going to the point in your life, and I want you to think of the most hideous sin you've ever committed in your life. Now, was you in, were you in God's hands? Was, was God um, an absentee potter? Did he just leave you on the wheel and turn and go do something else and you did what you did? Or was you still in his hands when you did what you did? Now, I'm in the hands of God, and God is responsible to work in me Philippians 2, 12, and 13. For it is God who is at work in you to will and to do his good pleasure. Philippians 1, 6. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. So who's working here? He who began a good work will bring it to completion. Are you working or is the potter working? For it is the potter who is at work in you. So 20 years ago, again, wherever your time frame is, on the most hideous sin you've committed, were you not in the potter's hand, and was he not at work in you? Now, were you perfect at that point in time that you committed that bad sin? No. Neither was I. Can you do anything other than what you were? Could, can a two-year-old do anything other than what a two-year-old does? No. Can a five-year-old... You, you know, these, these, these parents don't make three-year-olds clean their room. They don't make four-year-olds do the dishes and vacuum the house. Because they're not ready yet. Well, sorry, this is the growth in Christ. This is the process of sanctification. We don't get born again perfect. It's Sanctification is instantaneous and in that we're... Paul says in Colossians, we are complete in him. So positionally, I'm, I'm, I'm the righteousness of God, justified by God. I'm perfect in his sight. But experientially, he's working out by placing Christ in me, Christ in me, the hope of glory. I'm partaking of his divine nature, and the process of sanctification is taking place. And I'm growing daily, being transformed in the image of Jesus. Now, so I can't do anything other than what I did at that point in time. Now, that doesn't excuse sin. It's just reality, folks. I'm sinning today because there's weaknesses. You're sinning today because of weaknesses. Now, let's take it today. Now, let's say that you do something bad today. You sin today. I want to say, why did you do that? Because you're not perfect. And what you do today and who you are today is who you are in the hands of the potter. Now, do you understand what I'm saying? Let's just fast forward 10 years from now. And let's say I'm making mistakes today. I'm going to be going 10 years from now. Am I going to live in regret about... Today, the things I've done today, I can't do anything other than what I'm doing right now. Do you understand? Well, if it, that sin, that, 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 that habitual thing or this or that going on, if I could stop some of the stuff I do, I would do it. Do you think anybody wants to live and be in bondage to, to addictions or sins or anything else? You got them, I got them. We all got sin. We all, we're not perfect. And for you to tell me that you don't have sin, you're a liar. Bottom line. And I don't really want to talk to people like you. My, I'm saying that if I go 10 years from now, and this takes a thinking cap. you got to put your thinking cap on here. Okay? Don't park your brains outside the, 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 the monitor you're watching. Listen and walk with me through this. 10 years from now, I'm going to look back and go, boy, I wish I would have done that. Okay, now that I know that, then let's do it. Guess what? You can't. You can't. Because you're weak. Because you sin. And you're not perfect. 
So we, am I going to live in regret 10 years from now about what I'm doing today? Well, I know that I will. So why not change today? Why not change? Do you have the willpower? Do you have the self-effort? Do you got the, the, the desire even to change? When the Bible says, God is at work in me creating desire. Listen, if God wants a desire to change in me and you, he changes that desire. We wake up with new drives and new desires, according to Philippians 2, 12 and 13. I work out my salvation by letting him work it in me. And God's at work in me. He who began a good work is bringing it to completion. So is God distraught and destroyed and dismayed over what I've done 20 years ago? No. He knew it. When he called me, he knew every, he calculated all the freedom choices that I would have. And the ones that he didn't want me doing, he wouldn't let me do simply because nothing thwarts his purposes and plans for your life or mine. And look at Abimelech. He wouldn't let Abimelech sin, and yet he'd let somebody else sin. If it's going to, your choices are are limited. You don't, you're not as free as you think you are. God's got you hemmed in. And if you're so hell-bent on doing something, sometimes he'll say no. Other times he'll let you because he's working Christ in you. And he understands the process. Most Christians don't. And I'm going to tell you right now, I boldly say, I do not live in regret. I regret that I'm a sinner. I regret I was born into sin. I regret that I'm not perfect. And because knowing that, I will not live a life of regret. Because I can't change me born, born into sin. I can't change the fact that I still am dragging around this, this, um, this body of flesh. This, this, this um, pull of the flesh. Drag of the flesh, if you will. And that the flesh lusts against the spirit. And the spirit against the flesh. And both are in trench warfare. That's the Greek. Trench warfare against each other. And sometimes when I let loose my grip of faith, my trust in partaking of God's divine nature, I'm, my, my flesh is going to overrule, which all of us has that happen a lot. No regrets, folks. When I understand that, Lord, if you didn't want me doing that, you wouldn't have, done, you wouldn't have allowed me to do it. You wouldn't have given me the freedom to do it, the opportunity to do it. So that tells me then that God's not the author of my sin, but he definitely is governing my sin. And see, you don't hear that preached either. Let me give you an example. You have that little three-year-old, and for some reason it wants to touch that stove. It's, it's fascinated with the heat of the stove. And you see him. You see him going after that stove with his hand, that little hand. And you're like, oh, no way. And you grab the hand. You pull it back. Thinking, you know, well, he didn't know what he was doing. Well, tomorrow, guess what? He's going after that stove again. And you see him going after it again. And you pull his hand back. And you're like, wow, okay, he's got to learn something here. He's hell-bent on touching that stove. Now, I'm not going to let him put his hand on it and melt his flesh off, but I am going to govern. I'm overwatching him. Is it not the parent's responsibility to watch over the kid? And you think he's got to, I'm going to let him get, I'm going to let him get stung by it. He's got to know. See, because if I don't, there may be a time he puts his whole hand on there and really gets it. So I've got to be, I've got to be, I've got to have, i got to act in wisdom here. And see, God's the ultimate wisdom anyway. So, the parent says, I'm, I'm, I'm going to let him do that. I'm going to let him do that. And he goes and touches it, and you're there, and you pull the hand back just in time so it doesn't really do anything. And now the kid understands, wow, I ain't, I ain't doing that again. Or quit, or, or it's a four-year-old, and he keeps messing with the dog, and you keep the dog from biting him. Well, you know, one day, you're not going to be in that living room when he's pulling on that dog's tail, and that dog's going to lay into him big time. So you're governing the whole situation as a parent, and you're going to let the dog snap at him, maybe even, you know, enough to, so that kid doesn't touch that dog or pull on that tail like that again. These may not be good examples, but I think you get the picture. God is governing your life, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And if he, if he allowed you to sin, it's for a purpose. And that's not condoning sin. It's the reality that we are sinners. Well, I'm not a sinner. I'm saved by grace. Well, what do you do then? Do you sin? Yeah, I'm sick of playing these semantics and, and hearing these people say stuff like that. As if you don't 
have any problems. Yes, you're the righteousness of God, but you sin. Okay? And I, I want to deliver people. I don't want... I, I see so many... I, I remember this particular guy. He was divorced. And he would never preach. He wouldn't teach. Try to get him to teach. Try to get him to do something. And this mentality in the church that a divorced person can't really do anything. And so he, 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 he lived in regret. And he lived in, under condemnation. And the shame and the judgment of a sin that Jesus bore 2,000 years ago and wiped the slate clean. Listen, if, if 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, 20, 21 says, God's not imputing my sin against me, then I'm not going to live in regret over something he's not imputing against me. Now, if he's imputing my sin against me, and my sin made me a second-class Christian, and now I'm in the permissive will of God, do you understand there is no such thing, and we need to teach on this, which we have, but I ain't doing it now. There is no such thing as, the re religion made me think it for years. Until I sat down and figured this whole thing out, and went, oh, what, if that's the case, ha, everybody's in the permissive will of God if you sin once. Come on! Well, Maybe not. Maybe, maybe uh, I lied and it didn't take me out. Well, I'm gonna. I guarantee you, sooner or later, your sins have taken you out of the perfect will of God that doesn't exist. In fact, if he get get this, if he knows the end from the beginning, and all the days of my life was written before I lived the very first one of them, there's a book in heaven that your life was already written before you lived the very first one of them, and therefore that was the will of God. He wrote it. He did the eulogy over you. He spoke your name before the foundations of the world. He chose you before the foundations of the world. So he knew your life. He knew the decisions you would make. He knew the rights and the lefts you would take. There is no permissive will. There is only one will of God across the board for everybody. And he's able to allow us the freedoms and still hem us in and keep us in the direction that God wants us to go. Let me, let me close with this. I believe it was Luther that I read this. And it might have been out of the book, The Bondage of the Will. I'm not sure, though. But here's the, here's, here's the illustration I want to leave you with about regrets and the will of God, permissive will of God. I didn't want to get into that, but let, 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 me, let me close with this. Think of a river bank. you got one bank and you got another bank. And in between the two banks is the river. Now, you will never ever see the banks because God will not God will not allow you into onto the banks, but you're in that river. And it's got a stream, it's got a current, which is the grace of God, the will of God, the flow of the Spirit in your life, and the will, will of God leading you. The current is taking you somewhere. The life of Christ in you is moving you into your destiny, right? Well, you can fight that for a while. You can swim upstream. God knows you, you will. We all have. Who hasn't swam upstream? And we get wore out. We come to the end of ourselves and go, Wow, okay, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. I must decrease so that you can increase. And all of a sudden, you get with the program. Okay, you've learned your lesson. We've all gone through the round the mountain so many times. We realize, okay, and you get into the flow. And it's really easy. You don't got to do anything. You just you just wait. And the flow takes you. That's grace. Well, you can, you can go, Oh, I wonder what's over there. And bounce off of rocks. And get all scratched up, and bruised, and broken, you know, bouncing off of rocks because you you went over a little too far. But you're still going. See, this whether you're swimming upstream, bouncing off of rocks, or grabbing hold of limbs and and, and holding, you can only hold of that limb for so long before that current keeps pushing and pushing, and you let go. God's will will be done in your life. That's the commitment He makes to us as a covenant-keeping God. He's a covenant-keeping God, and when he says, He who began a good work will, will, not might, will bring it to completion. Well, but but it's uh, I, I'm a fr I'm, I'm free will. I can do it. Yeah, but he'll break that will, putting you on the pot, on the, on the wheel, the potter and the clay. Don't forget that analogy. The potter and the clay. And if he has to make you run certain laps as the coach and cause things to happen in your life, allow things to happen in your life, he'll do it to break that will. And he wins. God wins. There is no human that wins. Satan doesn't win. You don't win. God's will will be done. 
on earth as it is in heaven. And, and you know, you may think, well, that's not fair, but I don't look at it like that. I thank God he takes that kind of interest and commitment in my life because I know how I can be stubborn and stiff-necked. I know I'm not perfect. I need that current. And I need him to keep, keep um, pouring out his grace in my life that keeps changing me. And if I get hell-bent on something, he'll keep me from doing it or in his ultimate wisdom, allow me to do it. And then I go, oh, I'll never do it. Look, there's things I've done I say to this day I will never do again. He ain't going to get me to ever do that again. Been there, done that, learned the lesson. Thank you, Lord. You allowed it to happen. You allowed me to touch that stove, and man, that hurt. That particular thing ended in divorce. That particular financial decision ended in bankruptcy. Or I bought that car and I knew I shouldn't and it was a lemon and soaked me of all my savings. We've all done it. But we learn. And God will allow us, the Spirit of God, leading and guiding us into all truth through the will that you're on is the clay. And the will are the experiences of life. But anything and everything, the good, the bad, your sin, still when he says all things work together for good, that means your sin works together for good. You gotta look, look, look at the sin of Joseph's brothers worked for good. The sin of David and Bathsheba worked for good. How? It brought forth Solomon, and Jesus is in that lineage. Do you understand this? God takes our sin and works it for our good. Why have regret? How could David and Bathsheba stand there before the assembly of people today in heaven and say, boy, we sure regret doing that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Do you understand, David? If you regret Bathsheba, we don't have a Jesus. Huh? Are you getting it? This is the grace and the mercy of God that we, we don't see because religious thinking won't let us go there. And I'm telling you, do not live in regret because God took that thing and is working it for your good. And you're going to go back and say, okay, I, I know the terrible thing that I did, but wow. Look at, and I, I hate using this. Jim Baker to this day will tell you he's glad he went to prison. What? So if you're glad you went to prison, are you glad you did all that terrible stuff that caused you to enter into prison? No, he's just simply saying... I'm not going to live in regret. I am who I am today. God worked that for my good. Again, go back to David and Bathsheba. If they live in regret, we don't have a Jesus. So, w w David, David, come here. Come here, David. You know, no one else is around. Let me ask you something. If you could do it over again, would you, would you go up on that roof? Would you peer down at that, that lady taking a bath? Would you ask your servant to go get... What, you, surely and kill her husband to cover up her pregnancy because you impregnated her? Come on, David. W would you, if you could go back, would you change that? He would have to say, but do, yeah, I know that was terrible, but do you understand? Christ came out of that lineage. I, I, I can't live in regret. I don't like it, but I can't live in, I don't, I wouldn't want to change it. It was what it was. Don't live in regret anymore. Don't let religious people browbeat you into shame, guilt, and condemnation over something you did last week, last month, a year ago. Isn't it a shame that you could do something 20 years ago and they can't? You could do a thousand good works, but with religious people, one thing you do will never ever change the good you'll do the rest of your life because that's their stupidity in that religious mindset. I ain't saying they're stupid. It's the stupid mindset. It's the religious mindset that will not freely forgive because they themselves have been freely forgiven. And they're going to hold you. Those are the kind of people you want to be around. Walk away, but do not allow them to cause you to live in this regret. I'm going to close by saying this. I do, because I, I understand God. I can say this because I understand God. I understand His ways. I do not, and I will never live in regret. My faith 
is in the finished work of Christ and His blood and God's sovereign plan who's in control of our lives and all that we say and all that we do. And we're not perfect, but we entrust ourselves to the one who's perfecting us. Do not live in regret. Live a life of no regrets.